This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. We are joined by our own Ryan McMakin. Many of you, of course, are familiar with him as the editor of Mises.org and also The Austrian, our monthly publication. But he is uh, first and foremost an economist and came to us as a former economist for the state of Colorado. So welcome, Ryan. Uh, you know, what I want to talk about this week is really a big picture question, and that is whether we, meaning the West or more specifically America, are getting poorer. You wrote an article earlier this week on our site entitled Why California Has the Nation's Worst Poverty Rate. So I guess I'll, I'll throw it out there to start with this. Clearly, we know that world poverty is shrinking rapidly. There was a famous Oxford uh, university study, I think in 2013, maybe, that looked at some countries like Bangladesh and Rwanda. And clearly, the poorest places on earth are rapidly becoming less poor. And maybe even within our lifetimes, uh, extreme poverty will be largely eradicated. Well, and not only have some of the poorest places become a lot better off, but you're getting to the point even now where places that we regarded as extremely poor when we were little kids are be are feeling more and more middle class. I mean, Latin America, mm -hmm. with the exclusion of certain places, like places in Brazil and Venezuela overall, you go down there, they feel like more middle class places. They mm -hmm. feel like maybe the U.S. in the 1950s. And so, and, and so there's this, there's still an overuse of terms like third world and stuff because it doesn't recognize that a lot of those places we think of as people just living in mud huts and stuff like that. It's a totally different situation now. And it's thanks to the spread of markets and free trade, especially freer trade, especially that, that those standards of living are rapidly increasing. But yeah, we're seeing a different trend there where there's much more improvement quickly than what we're seeing in the West right now. I wonder if any of our progressive friends would argue that this is a triumph of governance, that somehow we've um, managed our way into prosperity in, in, in what, you, what we now term or what we term as a third world. Yeah, so much of what we enjoy today is a product of so much hard work in the 19th and the early half of the, the 20th century. Well, so the, the broad measure, uh, unfortunately, from our perspective, of the performance of an economy or the relative wealth of a country is GDP. Obviously, we think there are some problems with GDP. Uh, first and foremost, it includes government spending. It only considers retail or lower order goods. It doesn't consider all of the various stages of production that precede that. And it, it considers net exports when a, a country that just imports could, could be quite wealthy. So, so talk about, from an Austrian perspective, what the problem is with GDP as a, as, a, as a number. Well, as you stated, there's lots of technical problems with GDP in terms of how it's calculated. But even if it were calculated properly, there would still be problems with it because it's just the worst sort of aggregation and that it, it tells us how many goods and services are being produced in one giant economy. And, and, on, and that... I mean, that has some value if you're really wedded to the idea of tinkering with the economy and running numbers and all of that. But in terms of telling us how individual households and persons are doing, there's not very much useful information there. And and even worse is that some people disregard the importance of per capita GDP when they talk about GDP. I mean, GDP overall, if you've got a, a country with a billion people, of course, it's going to be huge. If those people are at all productive, uh, China is just always going to have a huge GDP. Uh, but once you start to take per capita into account, right, then it starts to make more sense for a country like Switzerland that has only eight, 8 million people. And then you should use that sort of thing to compare to a country like the U.S. that has 320 million people. So using GDP on its own is almost always pretty worthless unless you're talking about geopolitics because a country with a huge GDP is just going to be more powerful geopolitically. But if we're looking at terms, things like poverty and household standard of living, GDP overall tells us almost nothing. Well, I was looking at the IMF website recently, and they have some projections about which countries are going to have the largest GDP over the, in, in future years. And of course, China is projected to overtake the United States. India, of course, has a very large GDP. Brazil has a very large GDP. Uh, but what's interesting is that people aren't really clamoring to move to India from the West. And, and But more importantly, uh, 
we see in some of these countries where there's real extremes that you don't see in most of the West. Like in China, there China's full of billionaires, and it also has some rural areas that are that are almost uh, uh, unbelievably poor in the sense that they still don't have electricity and running water and toilets. We we had a, a scholar at AERC, our research conference last year from India, who said that half the half of Indians. Um, don't have indoor plumbing and toilets. So uh, talk about misleading. I mean, it, it's a crazy thing to consider if we think about it that way. Well, let's say that India had a GDP equal to the United States, which it doesn't. It's still low. But let's say it was. Well, keep in mind that India has three times as many people as the United States. So if it's got three times as many people and it's got a, a GDP that's equal, then the standard of living is a third of what it is in the United States. So you always got to do that quick back of the envelope sort of math. Anytime you're looking at GDP, you got to immediately think in terms of overall population. And so uh, the fact that, of course, Norway's GDP is very small, yeah, well, they got 5 million people. Of course, they're not going to have a big GDP. However, once you look at the per capita GDP, it's quite high. So we should really just kind of stop looking at GDP in the context of poverty and standard of living. It, it's, it's, it's fine if you want to look at, oh, well, these are the markets that uh, companies are going to want, most want to enter, or these are the markets that are going to be able to throw their weight around globally. Uh, but in terms of the standard of living of the average Indian, there's not much useful info there. Well, there have been some Austrians who have used alternatives. Uh, the late Murray Rothbard and our own Joe Salerno worked on a measure called gross output. I know Mark Skousen has done some work in this area. What, what would be an alternative uh, fr from a statistical or, or empirical approach? H how should economists uh, more accurately measure the, the wealth of, a, of an economy? Well, those other measures that, that look at a broader range of goods and services, maybe they could look at net worth. They're going to disregard perhaps government spending as being of equal value. And those are all steps in the right direction. I don't think they address what we're trying to address here, though. I mean, even if you had a good GDP that was measuring all of those other issues, you're still going to need issues. You're still going to need info like uh, median household income. Uh, you're going to have to look at and, and to be sure, there are international organizations that look at issues like number of toilets per household, okay. uh, the amount of wa water, running water in households, how many bathrooms are specific to that housing unit, right? Because lots of people still live in parts of the world where you're in an apartment building, there's one bathroom per floor and that sort of stuff. So when we look at that, also the other issue is net worth. We were just looking at, last week we ran on the Power Market blog, an article about the Fed and its research on net worth. So we're looking at debt in terms of as uh, debt compared to assets. All those things really tell us more about households than about just how much a whole country of uh, half a billion people is producing. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the United States itself. Uh, Ryan, and I, Ryan and I are both ex-Californians, so we have more uh, knowledge about the, the condition of the Golden State. I was just there visiting family a week or so ago and as I'm sure you're aware, there's some very unsettling things happening out there. There's a for, for people who know the Angels, the, the baseball team from Anaheim, uh, the, the Big A is their famous stadium. And that's a, a confluence where about three different cities, uh, including Anaheim, come together. There's a vast homeless camp that has arisen there along the Santa Ana River, miles and miles of people living on tents. I don't remember anything like that 30 years ago. Um, so while we think of California as rich, it, it's also got some huge problems. Talk a little bit about your article. Well, the this wasn't new data, but for it came up again because the LA Times ran a, a, uh, an opinion piece about it uh, that had actually come out of a different think tank. But the reason I, I, I talked about it is because it produced a backlash on the left. Uh, Mother Jones came out with an article trashing the LA Times article. And it's uh, it, this is kind of a black eye for California, because if you do look at this data that came out from the Census Bureau last year, using their, their different, their new, their adjusted poverty measure, then it mm -hmm. finds that California does, in fact, have the highest poverty rate is 20%. So one in five Californians are living a, a below this particular poverty line. Now, this is an improvement because historically, the Census Bureau has just used this 
well, since the 60s, they've used this, this poverty line measure. But that doesn't make distinctions from place to place. It doesn't take into account the, the cost of living. So you've got this one measure for Arkansas and this one measure for New York, which just doesn't make any sense at all. That's okay for, I guess, measuring over time, but from place to place, it's useless. And so they came up with this other, other measure. And, and not shockingly, California, because of its high cost of living, has a much higher poverty rate. And so when you bring this up, of course, this is very problematic politically for you pointing out, hey, look at all these southern states. They've got all these high poverty rates. The difference, of course, is in a lot of those southern states, the cost of living is much lower. And so when you take that sort of thing into account, well, suddenly now New York also and California move way up on that list. And as I did also on our site on, on another article, if you then take those median incomes by state also and adjust by the local cost of living, as you can do using uh, federal data if you want, um, then that also brings down the median household incomes in places like California and New York. So those places are poorer than you think once you take into account the cost of living. So it's it's not shocking that there are that there are these homeless issues there, although that's not mostly who we're talking about. We're talking mostly about people who live in their cars or live in trailers or live in very small houses with multiple other adults and family members. But that's just becoming more of an issue. A big driver of it is housing. Other issues are uh, energy. Um, and just the cost of living in general is more expensive there. So it, it's very hard to quantify and measure. There's so many factors to all this. But there's a sense, there, there's a feeling in the United States that things aren't right, uh, that a lot of people talk about real incomes have stagnated or even gone down in the past few decades, that Americans are getting poorer, that the middle class is being hollowed out. Is this correct from your perspective? What should we think about this? Well, you know, I don't want to be one of those people who, you know, one article comes out about declining median income or something, and then we just we declare everybody's poor now. So I do try to look at that in a more nuanced way. But if you do look at median household income, median personal income, those sorts of trends since the year 2000, there hasn't really been any movement. It was uh, it was it, it, of course, grew throughout the 90s. It peaked at a certain level, and then there's the dot-com boom, and then it went down, but then it exceeded that in 2007. But we have not recovered to that level yet when you're looking at those median income levels. And I'm talking about three different measures here. So you start to look at that, it starts to get convincing um, that median income really isn't going anywhere. And then going back to the, the net worth issue, when we look at that, net worth in adjusted dollars, again, we're, we're always looking at this in terms of uh, adjusted dollars, that's really gone nowhere since 1989 in terms of net worth. Now, that's an independent issue from income. But what it does show is that people are going more into debt. They're not saving. Even as they get higher incomes, they're just spending it away. So when I start to look at all that, I start to get fairly well convinced that, yes, people are not building wealth, that people are not having incomes, at least in dollar terms, that are matching what they had in, say, the late 1990s, and certainly not what they had at the, the height of the last uh, housing bubble. Well, if we take assets minus liabilities, my suspicion is that most of us, let's say uh, baby boomers, Gen X, and millennials, whatever age we are, on a pure balance sheet perspective, I suspect while most of us live better than our parents and grandparents did in a material sense, that our our, our our net worth is lower at the same age. We, we don't have the savings propensity. Well, and, and that's why we look at some of those other measures too, right? Is how many cars does a household have? That's certainly more now than there was in our parents' or grandparents' generation. How big are the houses? The average size of new construction and houses and then just houses in general continues to get bigger. And of course, in America, Canada, and Australia, housing is just so much bigger than the rest of the world. Part of that's just because there's more room. Uh, but yeah, people are in bigger houses, they got more cars. So when you look at those measures, yeah, I mean, the standard of living, you got to admit, in certain ways is higher. But this is all in, in spite of government, not because of government. In other words, uh, what we buy in the grocery today is, from my memory, vastly better than the 70s. Cars are unbelievably better. Houses are nicer and fancier and better insulated. Uh, 
uh, virtually everything is better. For, uh, uh, certainly medical care, consider going to the dentist, that sort of thing, what, what uh, a dentist can do. What you can do today with a tiny arthroscopic surgery scar where you go in and put a scope and find the damage first. All of these things are so much better. Uh, I wouldn't go back to the 70s. Mm -hmm. and I suspect you wouldn't. So, b But our balance sheets uh, maybe are lower. So what, what's going on here? Well, and of course, uh, our critics might point at that and say, well, if everybody's living better, right, what's the problem? So, oh, oh, we're, we're saying, oh, people have less savings, but their standard of living is higher and has been getting higher. So everything's fine. The, the, the problem you encounter is then, well, all that stuff about median income and net worth, uh, that only holds up as long as, of course, you have income. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, does ha it definitely impacts people who, who want to retire. And so we do hear issues of people who thought before the housing bust in 2007, who thought they were going to retire and do pretty well in 2007, 2008, they've never really made back that money. And we can see that in the net worth data. And so they really did have to adopt a lower standard of living. And so everything's, it's, it's going to be fine as long as you've got large numbers of people who continue to earn money and have wages and can support those people as they retire and go and leave the wage earning world. But that's not going to continue as these baby boomers retire. And as they're not bringing income in anymore, they're going to need to be supported more and more. So what you're going to find is that that income that's coming and all those cheaper goods that we're able to buy that's going to have to be siphoned off to take care of people who are increasingly pensioners and are no longer producing themselves. So you are really going to encounter a real problem there. Uh, the fact that the current income data seems to be holding steady, um, that's fantastic for us right now in the present. But as we look to the future and there are fewer people to produce things, that can be a problem. One thing we see anecdotally is a lot of baby boomer PhD academics who won't retire because obviously we know a lot of 28 year old PhDs who'd like them to retire so that they can get a job in a relatively fixed uh, zero sum environment <laughs> like the uh, number of professor slots in an econ department at State U. Um, but let me ask you this. It seems like since the crash of 08 that the ability to get good jobs that provide benefits uh, to obtain raises to put money aside it seems like most Americans think that's harder now than it used to be. Do you think that's true or do you think that that's our, our own uh, perception, our own failings? Well, it's harder because people want to spend more money yeah. and, can, and have a high standard of living um, as they see it. Now, it's, it's just like you were pointing out, though. If people's goal in life was to attain the standard of living that their parents or grandparents had, um, then they could work a lot less or sock away a lot of money. And, and people, I think, also lose uh, perspective. We've, I've done research for the site looking at the number of hours people work. People imagine that 50 years ago everybody was working these 40-hour weeks. That just There's no data to support that that there were some people who were lucky enough to do that, certain union workers and stuff, but most people were working more than that. They also, a lot of people imagine there was once a time where wives always stayed home and didn't work outside the home. That was a small group of people who did that. That was hardly, you know, a working class thing. And so people kind of have a skewed view of the past. If they really wanted to do some real research and figure out, okay, I am going to attain the standard of living that my parents had 50 years ago, well, they've already attained it in most cases, even if they feel poor now. Uh, it, part of the reason they feel poor is they watch too much TV and they're seeing all these things that they want to buy. And a lot of, and we've got $80,000 pickup trucks now. This is like, this is a thing, apparently. These aren't like for rich people. These are for people who, as soon as you figure out that you can swing the monthly payment on your luxury pickup truck, you go out and buy it. And so then there's no saving done after that. And that brings us to the other big downside, of course, of, of this issue is people aren't, people aren't saving as much because they want to ha have continual increases in their standard of living. And that is becoming somewhat easier because you're getting more luxurious goods at lower prices. But as, well, Frank Shostak especially has pointed out in a multitude of articles on the site, is real economic growth uh, just in the, you know, slightly out from where we are right now. If you want future economic growth, 
that's produced from real saving. You have to not spend right now in order to build that foundation of capital that future uh, growth is going to come out of. So we are shooting ourselves in the foot because we want to get and consume everything we can now. But if we consume everything now, we're not producing, we're not setting aside that capital that we need those goods cheaper and more widespread in the future. We are fortunate that we've got all these uh, countries with cheap labor and uh, access to capital in other parts of the world uh, that uh, that are continuing to pour in cheaper goods into America that's making things more affordable for now. Um, but we shouldn't just assume that the current status quo is going to continue forever. It, it would be wise to set away to set aside some money now that you're not going to spend so that there's capital in the future. Well, if we define a, a prosperous society or a wealthy society as one that accumulates capital and leaves capital for the future, even future ge generations, and if the saving rate in most Western countries is very low, in, in that sense, maybe the West is getting poorer. In other words, we're, we're, e we're eating the future, so to speak. We're enjoying ourselves today at the expense of tomorrow. Right. And so it depends a little bit there on how you're measuring wealth and standard of living. For me personally, my standard of living includes knowing I've got money in the bank. So in case I lose my job or there's a medical emergency, I can take care of it. You know, insurance guys always just say, well, I sell you peace of mind, right? Mm -hmm. Well, having money in the bank is peace of mind and that makes my life easier. I consider that part of a standard of living. Not That's not, I don't think, a common feeling uh, for many people. I think the I, it's, when people talk standard of living, they mean buying stuff. Uh, and not thinking about how soon they can retire, which also is important to me. And so how do you measure that, though? You can measure it in part by net worth, because people have a high net worth. They're going to be able to retire sooner. They're going to be able to deal with emergencies better. Uh, but it's not usually how we measure standard of living. So, But yeah, if you do measure it by that, I don't know if I could say that we're getting poorer uh, based on the data, but I could say that no... Um, no progress has been made in about 30 years looking at the, yeah. the data that the Fed was running. Yeah. Well, the, the, but one thing that has changed in the past 30 years is, of course, what central banks do. It, we're, in, we're in pretty uncharted waters in terms of virtually zero or in some parts of Europe negative interest rates. And in a certain sense, consumers and savers are acting rationally, aren't they? Saving is for chumps. You have to go out and chase yield through perhaps more exotic investments than our grandparents had to. They could just stick money in a savings account at their local bank and make whatever. Um, so don't central banks play a role in this high time preference environment we find ourselves in where people don't save money and they, they spend money? Yeah, there's a couple of ways they do that. One, and one that has larger global implications, is the issue of – uh, making uh, interest rates so low. So, you know, we want to drive down interest rates. Uh, we want to make borrowing very cheap. But what that leads to is that it also makes it very difficult to save if you just want safe investments like a savings account or a CD or something like that. So that induces a lot of people to spend rather than save. And so what that means then, though, is that once global situation so that it gets harder for the government to sell its debt, well, then suddenly interest rates have to go up in order to attract investment. Um, and nobody has the savings then to pour into that. So uh, there's a lot of steps here involved in this, right? right. So nobody's nobody's got nobody's got savings uh, because spending everything because interest rates are so low. One day the government realizes nobody's buying its debt anymore. And this could be, we could be talking about Europe, we could talk about the US. So then they realize, oh, well, we better increase the interest rate uh, for uh, our debt and as an attempt to make sure and attract people so that we can continue to issue more debt to finance our humongous debts that all of our governments have. Well, there's now no more backup savings. So people can't just suddenly pour money into this debt. Uh, they've got to now just start saving anew in order to uh, be able to afford uh, that government debt in order to, to be able to finance that. So that that means you got to make the interest rates go higher and higher. And that that now means at the government level, you've got to start paying out way more money into debt service. As Bob Murphy pointed out in his Florida talk recently, right? We're in a really good fortunate situation right now 
thanks to the central bank and thanks to foreign buyers of, of U.S. government debt, we can send out this government debt at these rock bottom interest rates. And that means only about 6% of the federal budget has to go to service that debt. That's you know, that's that's much less than we spend on defense and certainly less than we than we spend on Social Security and things like that. However, if as you pointed out, if you just if you let interest rates go up just to where they were, say, in mid 90s, God forbid, in the early 80s, we're talking about eight, nine, 10, 11 percent, those sorts of rates. Well, then, of course, that's going to double, triple, maybe even quadruple then what you got to pay on debt service yeah, to, to pay uh, for our just U.S. debt. And so now suddenly you got to pull money out of Social Security, out of Medicare, out of defense in order to do that debt service, or you just have to default on the debt. So now suddenly Americans are really going to feel poor in that situation because those pensioners aren't going to get those pensions or they're going to get them at deflated you know, values. People on Medicaid and Medicare aren't going to be getting the service they could. So now you're in trouble. So you got two levels there. You're sowing the seeds of government finance disaster. But you're also just creating a situation in general. People aren't saving very much and they're not planning for the future because why bother? I've got to get like really risky investments like risky stocks or, or something that nobody's ever heard of, hedge fund stuff, uh, in order to make money because uh, the savings account is basically worthless now. So when somebody like a David Stockman talks about this, this uh, fragility – that the, the Congress is addicted to spending more than it brings in in taxes. People are addicted to paying less in taxes than they receive in, in government's dubious services, but especially in entitlements. Uh, that the Fed is, is, and other central banks are crazy. That the average guy or gal is in deep trouble in terms of their own uh, personal finances. Do you think st- – Stockman, for example, overstates this. Do you think that the United States economy is is reasonably healthy and resilient despite all of our Austrian naysaying, or or do you think that things, from your in your opinion, are are very very iffy? Well, there is there's always resilience there in the certain sense that the productivity of the American worker doesn't just disappear overnight, yeah. and that you do have a lot of Americans who are willing to work long hours. Uh, in order to make ends meet. I, I think you would see a significant decline in terms of luxuries and the debt people are willing to go in. So there would be a decline in the standard of living in that sense. And that I, I, mean, I can't just go out and buy whatever I want to finance it now at any given moment uh, if we have a recession of some kind. So people are going to have to cut back there. But people are going to continue to go to work and put in a lot of hours. So you, it's not like we're all going to be living in caves or something. Uh, if the economy collapses, but people are going to be definitely in a worse situ- situation where than compared to where they were, and they're going to have a lot less stuff. The upside of that might be that they'll actually start to save money, and that was surprisingly, I don't think anybody expected to see this, was when the uh, you had the recession in 2008, 2009, savings rates went up considerably uh, because people had finally been kind of jarred out of their feeling that the housing prices always go up and everything's going to be fine and the economy is always going to improve. And we've overcome the business cycle, which is what economists, mainstream economists were telling us like in the late 90s and such. And so once once they, they got over that fantasy, they started saving money again. And that was really good. But now everybody's complacent again. So now we're seeing the savings rates are hitting rock bottom levels <laughs> again, some of the lowest rates we've ever seen. So people can adjust quickly and start to save again and start to rebuild uh, but I do think Stockman's correct in the sense of that that government debt issue continues to be uh, a real big problem uh, for the for the reasons of interest rates and debt service and the fact that there's not a cushion there now, right? There's there's not oh I've got savings I've got something to fall back on. The only thing you're going to have to be able to fall back on when the next recession comes is your ability to labor, and so you're going to labor a lot. And if you're a single household, single income household now, maybe you can become a second, uh, a two income household. So you could probably have a lot fewer spouses who stay at home now. They're not going to be able to do that anymore. Maybe grandma will have to take care of the kids because you won't be able to afford uh, uh, child care and that sort of thing. So all those adjustments will be made. But we didn't have to be in the situation where we're going to have to start out from that low, low level. We could have had some actual savings where we would have been able to adjust much more easily in that six months or year where we got to find a job. So we are going to see lots of foreclosures. We are going to see lots of people uh, have to move in with a relative and that sort of thing. Again, these aren't end of the world scenarios. Uh, 
but they are they do represent a real decline in the standard of living. And so, yeah, Stockman's Stockman's right in that people are going to go through some pain. It's just not like 16th century sort of famine type of pain. I don't see that on the horizon. <laughs> All right, you heard you heard it here, ladies and gentlemen. There won't be a 16th century famine in the U.S., predicts economist Ryan McMakin. But one thing I would like to mention, though, is that we don't, you know, maybe the police do a good job of herding the huge homeless camp to a certain part of Orange County where where the happy, shiny people by the coast don't have to see it. And maybe food stamps, which the usage of which went up precipitously during the Obama years, and I assume is, is still going up, I haven't checked. Uh, you know, the, those are this food stamp usage is equivalent to the bread lines uh, of the Great Depression. In other words, we we don't necessarily see how rough things are for people who aren't so lucky to have a, a, a good job or or good prospects for a job. That there's a lot of really desperate people out there, and we're able to live our lives either th- you know virtually in social media or even where we logistically go during our days. Um, those of us who are lucky enough to be working. Um, and, and so we don't see it, but Stockman is nonetheless correctly identifying a, a hollowing out of the lower end. Well, yeah, there's definitely something to the food stamp uh, issue. Now, to a certain extent, food stamp usage increased significantly over the last 20 years because they loosened the requirements. Okay. And so it became easier to get food stamps. But when we do look at how median incomes aren't really going anywhere and did decline a lot during certain parts of that period, that makes sense. Um, and so, yes, there are there are definitely more people on food stamps. It's not just because it's easier to get food stamps. Now, those numbers have been declining in the last couple of years because uh, we're, we're in the peak time of a boom. And so people are coming off food stamps as their incomes go up. Nevertheless, there's still a lot. Uh, maybe one in, one in six or so Americans are still on food stamps. That's, that's a lot. And so – in terms of the, the, how does that apply to the homeless issue? I mean, you do have a lot of people who are able to sustain themselves at these very low levels because food is so available and because there are a lot of programs. Of course, this whole idea that America is the social Darwinist place where you either work your uh, hands to the bone or you're just on your own. I mean, that's a complete myth. There are lots of programs. And notice also that most of the people you see homeless on the street um, are usually single men, some women, uh, but not many children, uh, because states, of course, are very expansive in terms of Medicaid spending on children. Uh, and there are lots of emergency shelters designed exactly for women, battered women, especially with children. Uh, and they go into places like where I work, the Division of Housing, and they're set up with emergency housing fairly quickly. Uh, so those issues do get addressed a lot. So it, it, you can't really look at the homeless population and see that as a one for one. There's also a lot more tolerance for people to just be homeless and be on the street. Uh, I think there would have been sweeps going through, you know, 50 years ago, much more quickly, just telling those people to move on, go away. They're arrested, put on buses and sent on their way and so on. So, uh, you know, you can just funnel them parts of town where you don't have to see them from your front window. And that sort of thing is how the more moneyed people in those, those neighborhoods think. Uh, but if it was easy to get a job and you could afford housing at a cheap level, those people would not live on the street. Uh, living on the street is, is an unpleasant activity if for no other reason than you want somewhere to go to the bathroom and get a shower. Right. I mean, and and so we do see some efforts in, in towns where they're trying to create like really cheap, uh, these like 500 square foot units and so on. Uh, but that brings us then to the issue of, of of why does California have such a high poor poverty level and why is there so many homeless? And part of the issue is that the cost of housing is really, really high. Now, some of that's due to just supply and demand factors, but a lot of it is due uh, to government intervention. And in the past, we ran an article, for example, on the disappearance of boarding houses and on uh, residential hotels. Those have largely been zoned away and gotten rid of in the 19th century. People who are currently homeless would have just rented a cheap room in a boarding house or a residential hotel. Those options are no longer available to them or they're greatly restricted in uh, where they are and how many of those units exist. And and today we just see local governments all the time restricting the size of the unit in terms of minimum size. It's got to be a minimum size in terms of uh, how good the housing looks uh, and all of those issues that then feed into restricting housing and that just leads then, that really does feed into the homeless issue. 
Do you think Americans are spending more uh, as a percentage of their income on housing now uh, than our, our parents and grandparents did? Obviously, there, it differs if you're in California or, 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 or New York or New Jersey or someplace in the middle of the country. But do you think overall Americans spend uh, a disproportionate amount on housing? Yeah, well, it depends on totally on where you are, right? Okay. In some cities, uh, Omaha, Indianapolis, uh, those non-coastal cities, uh, you're not spending a ton on it, especially if you want, again, if you wanted to attain the same amount of square footage uh, that your grandparents have, and you can find one of those smaller units, you can live in there. I mean, if if we were trying to mimic our grandparents, you could rent a two bedroom house and put four kids in there. And I'm thinking specifically of my, my grandparents, uh, where they had a two bedroom house, one bathroom, where they added, later added a second bathroom. But his two bedroom, my mother shared one room with three brothers and get this, the live in maid. Now, of course, when I say live in maid, I don't mean like. <laughs> Someone they paid a lot of money. I mean, like someone like an older relative or a cousin who needed a place to live and uh, make a living that was safe. And so it was a cousin or someone like that who lived there also. So those five people shared one room. Of course, the the married couple got their own room, but they weren't poor. This was a middle class household. So when you ask, are they spending more on housing as a percentage of income? There are two factors there. One is, in some cases, yes, because the housing is so expensive. But in other cases, they're spending more on housing just because they want more and better housing. So if you looked at the income that, say, my grandparents had, who are these immigrant couples who had like a liquor store and they work six days a week and all that sort of thing, they had a fairly high income compared to their housing because they, by choice, bought this tiny amount of housing that they could squeeze everybody into so that they had savings and could invest in other investments. And so you don't do that. You don't buy a two bedroom house so that you have more money to invest somewhere else or buy a second house. You might buy a second house, but only after you're living very comfortable right. in your first house. And so yeah. there are those issues there. Well, that's what's so interesting about this conversation. And I want to wrap it up with this topic. It's, it's hard sometimes to judge whether, whether we're getting richer or poorer because we're sometimes comparing apples and oranges. I want to talk about how the role deflation plays in, in how rich we feel. And, and, and then it's, it's corollary, which is technology and innovation. As we mentioned earlier offline, a DVD player, when that was a brand new thing in the late 80s, or early 90s, used to cost three or $400. Now you can get a little DVD player at Walmart for 40 bucks if you still have any DVDs. Now that's, not, that, that's, that's technology and supply and demand uh, making a product cheap and available to virtually anyone. And, that, and you can see that across uh, all kinds of consumer products. Uh, on, the other, on the other side of it, cars have gotten more expensive in terms of, of uh, a percentage of income, but they're so much better. They can last two or 300,000 miles if you maintain them. They have airbags and the transmissions are 10 times better. The, they, they all have power windows and great air conditioning, all these other things versus a Dodge Dart in the 70s. So um, talk about how deflation makes us richer, despite uh, what most people think. Def deflation is a good thing, not a bad thing. And, and why do economists get deflation so wrong? Well, one thing, of course, that's always important to keep in mind is that in the Austrian view, the natural state of things is deflation. So as we, we build up capital, as we become better at making things, we become more knowledgeable as a society, things become less expensive. So left on their own, if you just weren't tinkering with the money supply, things would become less expensive. However, due to the, uh, there, well, there would be price deflation. So prices actual would go down. Now, thanks to central bank intervention, right? We've all become accustomed to the idea that prices always go up in most things. The exceptions, though, of course, are as you know, right? Certain technologies, computers, those sorts of things, those prices are going down. Now, uh, Jeffrey Herbener has talked about this. It, it's hard to measure because the feds are always tinkering with the CPI, and the CPI is problematic because it just mashes so many different things together into one basket of goods. But if we looked at individual items like cars, Right, like technology, like TVs, and all those sorts of things, there is deflation going on there, even if those goods on the surface level seem to be going up. It's because, as you point out, they have so many more amenities contained within those products. So thanks to human ingenuity and the markets and free trade and all of that, there is a lot of deflation going on out there. It's countered, of course, by real price inflation 
in housing. And of course, for a long time, it was gasoline was, was impacted people a lot. Uh, and so there's really no one number we can point at and say, oh, look, all these prices are going up. It's because in some areas you are getting more value and more bang for your buck. So you always have to caution people um, when talking about price inflation. We got to admit that, that in many places there is price deflation as well. And that's always a good thing, right? Why would we celebrate? And I always wonder why we celebrate home prices going up. That's good, of course, if you're a current homeowner. But to the home ownership rates going down for one. And secondly, if you're a first time home buyer, that's never good. And so well, I, it seems odd to celebrate that. And of course, we would always celebrate the price of food going down if we're reasonable people. So there's so many factors there. We always, uh, I always, at least in articles, try to be cautious and not make blanket statements about how, well, this shows that there's inflation. Um, and and that that's and that now people can't afford those sorts of things. It really kind of depends on the good and service. But again, going back again, if all you wanted to get was like basic phone service and just one TV in your house, and you wanted one reliable car, and you wanted to have a roof over your head that wasn't extravagant, well, you don't have to work 60, 70 hours a week to to uh, afford that sort of thing. Assuming that the government isn't supporting policies that result in small houses being bulldozed to be replaced by something else or requiring minimum standards that drive the price of everything up, like, say, safety features in cars and so on. Some cars are more expensive for because some things are voluntarily included that people love, but at the same time, they're also getting more expensive because of certain mandated features. So we, in order to make a judgment about the government's role and all that, we got to pull all that stuff apart, and that's not easy to do. Well, I think we're out of time, Ryan. I'll leave with a couple points. First and foremost, uh, the, the only way to really judge uh, whether society's getting richer is on an individual level. If a particular individual is living better than they, he or she was before and, and is not doing so as a result debt, um, then he or she is, is better off. And second, I think that uh, this conversation shows that technology and innovation may oftentimes outpace uh, rapacious governments and central banks and, and make us richer uh, d despite their depredations otherwise. So that said, Ryan McMakin, thanks so much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.